Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Away. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about the strange relationship between Trump and Putin. Uh, how, if at all, does it benefit the United States? And I suppose we should ask, how, if at all, does it affect the election? Mm, probably does. Our co-host for the show is Tim Abicella. Our guests for the show, our esteemed guests for the show, Jean Rosenfeld, independent scholar, Manfred Henningsen, emeritus professor, uh, political philosophy at UH Manoa. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Before the show began, we were talking about uh, Navalny's memoirs, Manfred, and I wonder if you could, uh, you looked at it, and obviously it's relevant to all of this. Could you give us a, a precis and what he covered there, and what he covered about the relationship of Putin and uh, and Trump? Well, what I find uh, very rewarding uh, reading, I mean, first, it's a well-written book. When you start reading, you cannot put it down. It's like a mystery story, the way he he writes and describes his uh, involvement in Russian politics. But the characterization of Putin made me also understand better the connection, the relationship between Putin and Trump. They are both surrounded by greedy oligarchs. Uh, Putin and uh, Trump, uh, I mean, when you're thinking of the South African immigrant uh, Musk uh, and all of his friends, you know, Silicon Valley, they are not all the different mentally from uh, the oligarchs that Putin uh, has surrounded himself. And uh, they are um, mentally the same thing. But there's one thing that is fascinating in in the uh, memoir, the way uh, he describes the slow disintegration and collapse of the Soviet Union. And he does it in a way that makes you understand that Putin's empire will not last uh, much longer either. Uh, because he describes how uh, after the return of the Soviet troops from Afghanistan in 1989. They had been there for 10 years. They had 25,000 casualties. And uh, the uh, Soviet economy was in a mess. And it, it those two, it, I mean, the economy and the war in Afghanistan, in a way, defined the end of the Soviet Union. When you look at Putin's Russia today, the fact that he uh, has invited or not invited, that he's depending now on uh, troops from North Korea is an indication how bad the military situation for uh, Russia really is. And when you are adding to that the economic condition, you know, they, the interest rates went up to 20, over 20 percent, you could say you have almost a similar constellation in uh, Putin's Russia today that you had in the Soviet Union. Uh, in 89. When you are looking at the relationship the, the, between Trump and Putin, now he does not talk about it, but I think greed is something that really uh, binds them together. It's not only the golden showers, the, no the knowledge that uh, Putin may have about uh, Trump's sex life in, 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 in Russia, uh, but it's really the mentality, you know, of the two, the arrogance, the megalomania, uh, the and the total absence of any sympathy and empathy for people who suffer, um, it's quite extraordinary. Navalny, you know, I still think he made a mistake going back from Germany to Russia, but oh, never yeah. he, he he felt, you know, he had to show with returning to Russia, uh, that he appreciates the courage of his supporters in, in, in Russia. He not only becomes a kind of martyr, but he becomes uh, one who it's informs simple. us. He yes. informs us. Uh, yes, and it's very credible, you know, what he's telling us about. Oh, Putin. absolutely. Not, absolutely. Not only in the memoirs, uh, and and you know the decline of Russia, but also in the uh, increase in wealth 
uh, in the movie that he made about how how Putin is incredibly wealthy, and the oligarchs are incredibly wealthy. Yes. But let me go to let me go to Tim. Now we know that Putin helped Trump in 2016, and we know that he helped Trump unsuccessfully in 2020, and we know that from the press anyway that Putin is again helping Trump in the current uh, election. So why is Putin doing this? And what is the transactional backdrop for that? I mean, after all, I don't think he knew much about Trump, didn't know Trump. Trump is a real estate operator in New York. All of a sudden, they have a relationship that causes Putin to help him in many ways in three elections now. What's the backdrop for that? Why? Well, it's obvious to me. Um, Putin has interest for Trump to kill any and all support for Ukraine. It's as simple as that. Putin wants Ukraine, and he won't stop with Ukraine. Uh, he'll go into Moldova and other countries in the Baltic states. But he wants Ukraine, and he wants it bad. And he knows that his best shot is for tr Donald Trump to become a second-term president to kill all support and funding for Ukraine, because he doesn't think the EU countries are going to continue uh, without the United States to support Ukraine. To tack on to that, uh, in Bob Woodward's book, War, uh, Trump has, has been, it's been documented that Trump had seven separate conversations with Vladimir Putin. In addition to Trump sending Vladimir Putin um, COVID testing kits on the early days of COVID-19, I have yet to hear one reporter or one news organization asked Donald Trump, so of those several conversations, number one, why didn't you inform the State Department or the FBI you took place in those conversations? And secondly, what did you say? What did you talk about? Uh, did you talk about Ukraine and uh, strategies for Ukraine and what you would do or wouldn't do if you became a second term president? Um, I also would ask to what degree if those conversations took place not if, but what was said in those conversations, to what degree does the 1790 uh, law of the Logan Act comes into play with a private citizen interfering with the federal government and its foreign policies? Yeah, I think what, what you're saying is that they have a, a very unusual relationship. Um, they have a direct relationship which um, effectively borders on diplomacy and violation of the Logan Act. And you can also um, ask that, about Musk. Is Musk playing a liaison between Trump and Putin? Musk has had several conversations with Vlad. Okay, I want to go back, Gene. I want to go back to uh, James Comey. Um, because at the time Trump was uh, first in office, uh, Comey and the FBI were investigating uh, Trump's relationship with Russia. Um, and uh, as a result of that investigation, Trump mm, put Comey's job on the line. Uh, effectively to say that if Comey continued that investigation, uh, he was going to lose his job. And uh, I don't know to the extent the extent to which uh, Comey continued the investigation, but he did he did lose his job job summarily not too long after. And then uh, McCabe w was fired shortly after that. Um, so the FBI, to the extent it was in involved in an investigation of this relationship, um, was was damaged. And I'm sure that damage was profound, uh, both at the top and, you know, throughout the organization. Um, your thoughts about that? Why did Trump want to neutralize that investigation? It seems like that's that's more than more than just a mm, friendly Logan Act type relationship. Why do you want why do you want to neutralize that? Well, we can count on two things with Trump. First. What comes um, of highest priority to him is what happens to him personally. And I can imagine of those seven conversations he had with Putin, he was talking about Trump and all the things that, that uh, affect Trump personally and how Putin could help him. Secondly, he's transactional. The, relate, the way he relates to everybody is he makes deals with them. And then he tries to manipulate the deal, so he comes out on top. And I am sure Putin understands that because Putin's pretty transactional too. They don't have a normal relationship because of their personality disorders, but you can count on that. With respect to Comey, if you are going to establish 
a higher degree of power than the president is allowed to have in a constitutional republic. You have to maintain control over the security systems of the state. And that is internal security systems such as the FBI primarily and external security systems such as the armed forces. So that's like the first order of business almost. I think what happened to Comey is a prelude, is a uh, case study of what could happen to a lot of people if Trump wins this election. Because I think he, the first thing he's going to do is consolidate power, uh, personal power. It all comes back to himself as a person. That power has to reside in him. When he says jump, he wants people to jump. And he doesn't want any intermediaries trying to manipulate him or distract him in any way. So I think what we're seeing with Comey was that Comey was disloyal. Whether or not Comey had the goods on Trump, we don't know. We don't have that data. But he was disloyal. And he was inconvenient. And in this respect, he went after McCabe, too, because he's out to neuter the strongest internal national security organization. I mean, the FBI has struck fear into the hearts of uh, everyone it goes after, whether these are uh, radical right-wing violent people like Aryan Nation or they are uh, animal rights activists uh, planting bombs. <laughs> or it's the mafia. Uh, so Trump had to send a message. I'm in charge. I'm more powerful than you and I can manipulate you. And if you get out of line, I'll just put my own people in there. And that's what is going to happen first, if he's elected. Yeah, it's all the security uh, organizations and institutions. It's the intelligence community. It's the uh, investigation community and the FBI. It's, of course, the Department of Justice, and it's the military. He wants control of all of that. Made, he's made it clear. But this was a kind of a peek into the future here, what he did with Comey, and began to realize exactly what you're saying, even way back when. So, Manfred, you know, let, let's talk a little about the Mueller investigation. You know, that came kind of as a surprise. What, what happened here? $400 million, and then it gets to Congress for an impeachment? Um, and then we find out that uh, Trump was trying to use Zelensky. Um, how did Putin play in that? How did this affect his relationship with Putin? It was extraordinary when it first came out. And imagine an investigation and then an impeachment um, right in the middle of his term that really the public was not fully aware about this. Um, what happened there and, and how did Trump feel about it and how did he undermine it? A lot of what you uh, of what you mentioned is all. I mean, it adds to the what should I, should I say the instability of Trump's position. I mean, both of them uh, create this image of power, but they are not really as powerful as some of us, and, and I think. You also think they are. I mean, reading the Navalny book, I get really come away with this impression that Putin's position is so weak that uh, you know his regime can collapse uh, at any time. And I mentioned the the introduction of the North Korean troops. That's not a sign of power. That's a sign of weakness. Uh, extraordinary weakness, and everybody realizes that in Russia. Look, the 200,000 casualties, they have created uh, an, an amazing uh, sense of uh, threat within Russian society. The way, you know, uh, the senile rulers of the Soviet Union were confronted with when uh, 25,000 uh, Soviet soldiers died in Afghanistan. So you find yourself in a similar situation. Now, the relationship between Putin and Trump, I think, is a personal 
uh, really, they love each other because they are very much alike um, in their uh, disrespect for institutions, um, for, you know, in Trump's case, for the Constitution. Uh, for that reason, you know, uh, the, <laughs> well, first, I do not think Trump will win the election. Uh, now, what will happen then? God knows. But in any case, I do not, uh, oh, I don't want to overemphasize uh, the, the power of these two guys. They are in very weak position. To, I mean, Putin may be more. Well, do, do you agree, Manfred, that what Trump was doing in withholding the $400 million was for the benefit of Putin? And this, you know, this followed what we were talking about a little while ago about how uh, Putin helped him in the election in 2016, and now uh, Trump was uh, helping Putin. Transactional, as Gene said, um, using Zelensky uh, as a way to uh, compromising Zelensky, if at all possible, so that uh, Putin would have the leverage. It seems clear that there's three people in the formula: Trump. Zelensky and Putin, right? I think uh, the European Union and NATO now, under the leadership of the Dutch former prime minister, right, uh, play a role also. And in contrary to what Tim uh, suggested, that uh, the Ukraine will not continue to become supported by the European Union uh, if uh, Trump becomes president and withdraws, you know, support, I think the support from the European Union will grow because uh, Europeans are scared of the irrational leader of, uh, of Russia. So for that, for that reason, uh, I think the skepticism that uh, Americans have about Europeans, uh, especially uh, in relation to Ukraine is uh, overrated. I want to move on to uh, Tim on something that you mentioned, Manfred. You talked about the steel dossier and the golden shower. Right. You know, at the time, at the time, uh, Tim, that this was uh, revealed, uh, there were questions about whether the steel dossier was credible. Steele was a, I think he was a retired intelligence official from the UK. And he wrote this up, and um, the, you know the press printed it. Uh, but then you know, there were attacks on the credibility of it by Trump and others around him. And the whole thing settled down: is uh, can you really believe in the Steele dossier and the golden showers and the sexual aspect of that? But now, and today, as we look back, Tim, as we look back, um, you know, from the comments that Trump has made about the Puerto Ricans. And the comments uh, that uh, Trump has made about uh, Kamala Harris, but the sexual comments that he constantly makes and, and the people around him getting in trouble on scandals like this, um, and his own uh, criminal actions in the way of uh, the E. Jean Carroll case, um, you know, suggests to me that he's, and his relationship with uh, Jeffrey Epstein, remember him? So all of these things do point to a kind of creepy thing about Trump. And I just want to you know, deal with that separately for a moment and ask you, do you feel differently about the credibility of the, of the sexual charges in the dossier now, after having seen more, after having learned more about Trump's predilections? I'm reminded of an old uh, saying that we learned in grade school. If it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. And we've seen enough stories about uh, Trump's in and out of his uh, sexual misdeeds for over 10, 15 years. Whether he walks in on a, um, uh, a, young, uh, a room of young women who are barely of age for the Miss, uh, Miss America pageants or Miss Teen pageants, because Donald Trump owns those pageants and walks in on them on a state of uh, undress, or, or any other of his escapades, uh, the, the Hollywood Access video. I mean, how much data do we need to fill in the blanks? Do we need to see him in the act? No, you don't. It's called a preponderance of, of what's in front of us. 
And I, I think, to answer your question, um, I think there's probably some credibility to the Steele dossier. Remember, the Senate uh, completed a 1,000-page uh, panel report that talked about the interactions of the Trump associate, associates and their interaction with Russian operatives. Uh, I'm reminded specifically of, of election chair Paul Manafort, who, who had a very multiple meetings with um, Konstantin Kolilnik, uh, a Russian intel officer. I mean, these things don't happen by accident. Um, is Trump going to be directly involved? No, because he needs his liaisons. He needs his back channels. And he has used them effectively for decades. Um, so the, the history between Donald Trump and, and, and Vladimir Putin and those that came before Vladimir Putin um, have been gone on for years. Uh, Russia became Trump's banker when uh, United States American banks wouldn't touch him. Some of those banks now have gotten in trouble for money laundering. And, uh, you know, Trump has a whole line of, of, of real estate transactions, particularly in Florida, where he had multi-million dollar mansions that set, un you know, that were listed for months and months and months, no action. Um, what did he do? He increases the price of those mansions by millions, and they're snapped up in a second by a Russian oligarch. Okay? How does that happen in the real world of real estate? It doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Real estate's one of the best ways to launder money. And certainly, that's the best way that Russia could give Trump his compensation through real estate transactions. The transactional aspect of that relationship not only existed at the time he uh, that Putin helped Trump in 2016, but all through. They've had transactions all through, uh, some good of point. which we know about, others which we don't. Yeah, good point. Uh, Jean, let me go to you. Let me follow up on the Mueller investigation, which, you know, is actually should be caught in all our throats. Um, why did Trump try so hard to undermine that investigation? How did he undermine it? Uh, how did the attorney general undermine it? And what was Mueller really saying to us in his cryptic comment at the end, if you remember, where he got up and made his closing statement? I'm not sure he was all together at that time. But what he did say is, if you want to you want to have a takeaway from my investigation, you better watch out for Putin. You remember that? Yes, it was a very sad time, and it was a sad display of Mueller, who was brought into this because of his integrity, of his lifelong integrity. And what we forget is that integrity is perhaps the most dominant characteristic of a heroic personality. So he was widely admired in his field, and it was thought that he would perhaps uh, with the strength of his um, moral um, engagement, uh, persuade the Justice Department and others uh, to follow suit and to follow up on what he had found. But what we discovered is that just like Hitler, when you approach a strong man like that, uh, utilizing uh, integrity, and honesty and uh, a certain degree of balance and um, rationality, he just runs right over you like a tank. Um, and Trump did that too. So um, Mueller was not able to uh, get his point across because nobody picked up the ball. And that was the point. Uh, Trump did not want that investigation to go any farther. Now, I always thought that the Steele dossier had an element of truth to it uh, because it, you know, it was widely uh, disparaged as having been uh, financed by Hillary Clinton. In fact, it was first financed by Jeb Bush, and we forget that. So it was uh, a bipartisan uh, investigation. And uh, another thing we forget is that when the Steele dossier came out and became a global story, uh, a couple of very high ranking, I don't remember specifically who they were, Russian generals and members of Putin's circle disappeared. And they've never reappeared. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to understand also there was a woman 
in the United States who became a spy. Uh, she was escorted out of the United States. She had a boyfriend here and she was trying to get the goods on Zelensky. And she showed up in Navalny's cell interviewing him for a Russian state TV show. So all of these shadowy characters and especially Paul Manafort and his connections all tell us that there are strings that attach Trump to Putin in terms of his inner circle, which are the kind of the underbelly, the, the characters that you would you would maybe find in a mafia movie uh, who have absolutely no integrity, who um, act like the SS when it comes to interacting with weaker individuals in terms of relative power, not that they're weaker in their terms of their character. So there's so much we don't know, and I think historians are going to have a field day in the future. Uh, let me let me go to one other thing uh, that's in this array of strange transactional events, and that's the Trump Hotel in Moscow. Um, that popped up in the middle of all of this, and uh, Trump effectively denied it, didn't he? Uh, he denied that that he was building a hotel in Moscow, and he denied that Putin was helping him. Do we know more about that today? Uh, is there a hotel in Moscow? Uh, or is uh, my my thought is if there isn't one, there will be one if he wins. Your thoughts about the Trump Hotel? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we we don't know. But 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 going back to Navalny for a moment, because he was a very smart man. Um. He attacked Putin uh, in terms of Putin's corruption and finances. He exposed that. He did that effectively. And that really rattled Putin, uh, rattled him enough that he tried to kill him with poison. And uh, did not expect Navalny to come back, I'm sure. Mon Navalny made a very interesting uh, comment in his book. Uh, he, he said that um, he went back because if he hadn't gone back, it would mean he had no convictions. Because if you have convictions and you don't act on them, then they're just thoughts in your mind. And that's, that's a principle that I've internalized from what he said, because it shocked everybody when he went back. But he's absolutely right. Had he remained in exile, um, he'd just be another voice. Mm -hmm. But he went back to model for everybody. And I think I, I think we can take this as a model too, that there is only one way to confront somebody like this, and that is to expose the truth. And that the truth has not been exposed, but we've seen enough. And the parallels to what happened before World War II and during World War II, um, are striking. Uh, I just came back from Eastern Europe. I went to the KGB Museum in Vilnius, Lithuania, a museum of uh, occupation and resistance. Uh, it made a deep impression. I went to the Von C Villa, where the final solution conference was held for an hour and a half, and they hammered it out in a 15-page protocol, which miraculously survived. I went to a concentration camp uh, where you can't imagine the gut punch uh, of walking into an almost silent concentration camp in the middle of a beautiful farmland um, and to read the, what happened there. These things uh, are alive in Europe, in these countries. They haven't forgotten. And uh, they are a, they are something that the school children were visiting these places in these countries, in Lithuania, Poland, and Germany. The school children visit. We don't have anything comparable in this country. We have just lost our memory of what happened in my father's generation and all the men that volunteered like him to save this world from what we're experiencing today. This reminds me of uh, Eisenhower's uh, demand that the um, the local um, neighborhood around Buchenwald uh, provide a thousand people 
local German people to come and watch uh, the the Buchenwald camp. It was not Eisenhower. It was Patton. Okay, thank you. What Patton uh, demanded, uh, and it's described. Uh, I mean, you have if you have video of that event. Uh, so it, it because Patton, remember, was the guy with who liberated Buchenwald. Um, even though the East Germans claimed, you know, it was the self-liberation of the inmates, the communist inmates of Buchenwald, that's a propaganda lie that they presented, and that's manifest in that huge monument that you have uh, between Weimar and Buchenwald, uh, where the Americans are not commemorated, it's the Soviet troops and communist Jews are not commemorated. It's a really uh, if, uh, a communist uh, propaganda lie, this monument. It's still there. It was opened in uh, 54 um, by the regime, the East German regime. But let me come back to one of the things that uh, uh, you, both of you were talking about, and Tim also. I think Trump and Putin are made for each other because they are alike in their thinking. The difference between the two is we know all about Trump's behavior or most of it, but all of Putin's behavior is hidden um, and covered up you know, by uh, the Secret Service. People are arrested or they are you know, removed somewhere where they cannot talk or you know, their planes crash. Uh, when they get too close to the truth that uh, they don't, that Putin does not want to be uh, publish, uh, publicized. So what you have there, I think even in the sexual behavior, and Nadalny makes uh, references to that also in his memoir, uh, Putin and Trump are very much alike. The difference is Putin, I mean, Trump cannot hide it uh, because his victims come forward. In Putin's case, um, you know, they rem all his trespasses remain secret. So for that reason, you know, you you do not have the same kind of track record. But when the two guys met in Helsinki, for example, you have this stunning uh, performance by uh, Trump saying, you know, he trusts Putin uh, in a way more than his security people. Um, I think uh, what you have there are two egomaniacal, tyrannical people, greedy, uh, besotted by sex, who like each other for these reasons and are surrounded by people who support, I mean, the oligarchs, the, the, the Musk type American. <laughs> Oligarchs, Vance belongs to that uh, group uh, as well. I mean, he comes from that background, from that oligarch background, um, and and the the, the Russians. Uh, I mean, when you when you when you read Navalny's description, you know, of the oligarchs, how they set up villas uh, in the West Indies you know, on an island, it's absolutely stunning. It's, it's the same thing that uh, you have here. So in that sense, you know, the mystery of the relationship between Trump and Putin is not really a mystery. They are very, very much alike. Let me ask you this, Manfred. This is really important from a, what do you want to call it, a, a political philosophy point of view. Now, we've seen a lot of people who Trump was close to for one reason or another during his first term and during Biden's term. But those relationships have all have all failed, and the books and the articles come out, the memoirs come out, uh, and the relationship that you might have thought Trump had with these acolytes disappears, and now they're enemies. Presumably, he would go after them if he was in office again. So now you describe a relationship between Trump and Putin, very close. They, they admire each other. I don't know who's on the top. I rather think that Putin's on the top and that Trump is, you know, is, is subservient to Putin's leadership. But whatever relationship is exactly, 
It's a relationship that's built on the wrong kinds of human sensibilities. The question I put to you, Manfred, is, is this a sustainable relationship or will this fall apart like all the others? Remember the relationship that, that Stalin had with Hitler? That fell apart, didn't it? I think uh, all of these stories that, that you just mentioned, uh, books, interviews, video uh, presentations, will lead to, well, I think you and I agree on that, Tim, I think it's a little bit uh, undecided, but I think will lead to the def defeat of Trump. And uh, having read uh, Navalny's book, I do not think that Putin will stay in power for a long period of time. You know, he is weak. And the, the fact that he had now North Korean tro troops fighting. When he fails, Manfred, as he declines, Will his relationship with Trump decline, and vice versa? Will Trump's relationship with him decline? Well, it, it have we seen end. any indication of the dynamic of that relationship? It will end. It will end. The relationship is not a relationship that will last if, if either one of them, you know, or both of them. I mean, they may be buddies uh, in the West Indies or at uh, Lagomar in. in, in, in Trump's villa in Florida, but no, it will. It's not a lasting relationship. It's really a relationship of convenience, of two dictatorial, egomaniacal, uh, greedy uh, people. Let me follow up with Jean on one point you've mentioned, and that is, and which she mentioned also, is we are we are <clears throat> we are concerned about the truth. Uh, with Trump, we have a certain amount of truth that comes from the press and all the people who. I turn him in. Um, but Gene, um, you know, is is the dynamic we're talking about also functioned on the revelation of the truth? In other words, if the truth comes out about Trump's real relationship with Putin, the explanation for some of this bizarre, if not perverse, uh, you know, conduct that they both engaged in with each other, if the truth comes out about that, Will that accelerate the decline of their relationship? Not necessarily. The truth is one more target for someone who wants to manipulate the mindset of a very large movement of people that support him. I mean, to a certain extent, the relationship of the religious nationalist right with Trump is transactional also. They don't personally approve of his behavior, but they like the way he's dealing with appointing ju judges and justices. So they cave, they, they have a quid pro quo. And enough people are then convinced by the narratives, the propaganda narratives, and explain uh, and who target the truth that there is an alternate reality created. We also live in the middle of a huge technological revolution where for the first time we have created devices through the internet and computers uh, and the tech technical revolution we have created devices that mimic human thought, that can create a visual alternate reality, that in, involve people turning knobs and making choices so that all they can surround themselves with this virtual reality. And that becomes a great weapon in the war of a would-be dictator who must establish a narrative that the majority or at least a significant plurality of the people that he rules over believe so that they participate with him in the delusion that he embodies and represents all of them and every decision he makes 
is to fulfill their will and their desires, give up their freedom in order to gain this security that they want. So, Tim, I, I saved a very juicy question for you, if you don't mind. Um, so, of course, we, we can make the assumption that if Trump wins, given all of our discussion today, um, he will, as he said he would, he would surrender Ukraine to Putin on the very first day. What is the transaction there? Is, is it over? If Ukraine is surrendered to Putin, is there more between them? Um, what is likely to happen after he does that on the first day? Well, I think you came to a natural conclusion or statement about surrender. Uh, Trump said he would solve the war on the first day. Uh, but you and I and, the, uh, and, and Manford and Gene, we all know that means capitulation. Um, so if he's elected in the next six days, we all know that uh, either the relationship between Putin and Trump flourishes or it begins to disintegrate and unravel because he will no longer be the useful idiot that he has been for the last eight years. And because Putin, like Trump, is transactional, um, he knows this will be his last hurrah at the crack at the political stage. And therefore, he'll be discarded like uh, yesterday's newspaper. Yeah, I suppose uh, the, the alternative to that is that Putin helps Trump become a perpetual dictator in the United, United States with more of uh, what Gene was talking about, the high-tech social media propaganda beamed into the United States. Uh, so it's possible that there'll be another chapter in their very strange and perverse relationship where uh, Putin helps Trump go the, the next round, so to speak. What do you think about that possibility? Yeah, I mean, Trump's, we won't hear the end of Trump for, for years to come. I mean, for four years, the 2020 election was stolen. I could hear Donald Trump in the echoes in the airwaves on Fox and um, Newsmax talking about the stolen election of 2024 until 2027, minimally. Yeah. And the two of them are both um, getting on in years. You really wonder what happens to this relationship we've been examining if one of them can't continue or dies. Trump more so than Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time for uh, final thoughts, if you guys don't mind. Uh, let's begin with you, Manfred. Uh, what would you leave with our listeners about this, this uh, relationship and what it means to the United States, what it means to Europe, what it means to Ukraine, what it means to Putin? I'm not as pessimistic as uh, some people are about next Tuesday. I still think there is a majority of uh, thinking Americans who will not... <clears throat> Put, put, put Trump back into the White House. Uh, so for that reason, I do not believe in the victory of uh, Trump. Uh, and then I think one should not overestimate uh, the power that uh, people always connect with Putin. Uh, after having uh, read the, the Navalny memoir, I must say, I find this parallel to the, the decline of the Soviet Union in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, much more convincing as a model for what is happening to Russia today. We do not hear much about the response of uh, Russian civil society because uh, the it's simply cut off the reporting about that, not mm -hmm. only by the Russian media, but uh, also by, by foreign observers. And I think Russia is in a really worse shape than uh, people uh, anticipate, economically, uh, mentally, but especially in terms of the impact of the 500,000 casualties, the 200,000 dead and the 300,000 uh, wounded. Gene, could you make your you know statement and what you want people to remember about this? And let me let me suggest one one area you might address is the fact that um, here we are a few days away from the election. 
Um, and if we found out the things that maybe we should have been able to find out before, if we found out the truth about this relationship and what has happened uh, since Trump originally took office, was originally helped to take office in 2016, if we found out uh, the truth, would that affect, do you think, the the, the election? I, there's no time for it, but it's a hypothetical. Again, not necessarily, because so many people have invested in Trump that what we call the exit costs would be very high. People are always needing a meaning in life. And if you find it in a dictator or would-be dictator, uh, you don't necessarily uh, get over that right away or discard your opinion. There's something called cognitive dissonance where you may reinvest in that person, even when it seems even more un unlikely that that person was truthful. Um, Trump is a loser. He has lost politically since he became president. He, in every election, those he supported have lost. He himself has lost. And yet he has maintained the fictional narrative that he's a winner. And look at the support he's got. So that tells you something. So if, Putin, if Trump were to fall apart, which he shows signs of doing, or lose the election, the election will be contested by those who don't want to give up uh, their belief in him. And they will perhaps seek another uh, vessel for their hopes and dreams. And that vessel could be uh, advance. Uh, who I wouldn't underestimate Vance. Uh, he's a pretty smart guy, and he knows how to consolidate uh, support among those people, and he would inherit the mantle. Yeah, we, you know, it was funny. We have the possibility of an oligarchy just, just like Russia. And it runs a parallel where uh, Putin is able to, you know, uh, suppress the truth and Trump tries really hard to lie his way out of the truth. It's not the same mechanism, but it's the same mission. Uh, Tim, your thoughts, your your message to people? Yeah, thank you, Jay, for the opportunity. I hope as your co-host, you'll allow me a little leeway here in my response, my final closing response. Um, we have six days before election of, of a, between Vice President Harris and Trump. And many people that are planning to vote for Trump are doing so because he's such a brilliant businessman, an excellent success in all his businesses, including Trump Tower and all his hotels. So I want to respond to your question you asked her earlier about what happened to the Trump hotel that he was working on in Russia that he denied. Well, there's an update on that. And it's been quietly redesigned. And it's been built. And it's on the border, but in the Ural Mountains between Russia and Kazakhstan. And it wasn't necessarily built as a high-rise luxury hotel. Uh, it's been reformatted, revamped. It's now a three-story walk-up, and the name of it is Motel Trumpsky Villa. And the amenities that are included in this grand design of Trump's is a coin-operated 25 cents Magic Fingers bed vibrator, a 13-inch Philco color TV, and a 35 thread count bed sheet. That is the Donald Trump businessman success story that people are voting for that think he is such a genius. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Manfred, for a very robust discussion about uh, a set of events and issues that are have been largely behind the screen. Someday we'll know more. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.